Welcome to lecture 1.3 uh, in Cognitive Psychology. This is a short lecture about some of the applications of what we're going to learn in this class and how it might uh, help you uh, in other classes, well, also in this class, um, and also just uh, how you might be able to use some of the insights from Cognitive Psychology uh, in studying and learning things in general. Uh, so we'll talk about a lot of the you know, specific details about memory and uh, attention in subsequent classes, uh, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the applications. Um, so cognition in the classroom or at home. Uh, what's the first thing you notice when you see uh, this uh, picture? Uh, this is not a picture from Western, but this is kind of what uh, this, what a lot of large classes look like. Uh, first of all, I'm sure you're all thinking like, Holy crap, that's a lot of people packed uh, close together without masks uh, in, in one room, right? Uh, that's because this was taken a few uh, years ago. But still, you know, that's still pretty tight. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like looking at it. I, didn't like looking, I don't like that kind of packing in uh, before COVID, and I certainly don't like it now. Uh, but what's the second thing that you probably notice? Everybody's got a laptop, right? Uh, mostly an Apple, but not always. Uh, so like literally almost every student that's sitting there has a laptop open on their lap, uh, a computer on the uh, desk, uh, and they're taking their notes, right? Um, if I were presenting this in class, which I often do, uh, it's exactly what I see, right? And that's exactly how I look when I'm in a meeting too. So if I go to a, a lecture or if I attend a meeting with other faculty members or if it's a research meeting, I'm almost always going to bring... Um, a laptop with me. I don't always use it for notes. Uh, I do tend to take notes uh, in a notebook um, and then fill in the details later, but I've always got an iPad or uh, a device uh, or a laptop with me because sometimes you just, you know, it's an easy way to take notes. It's also a way to follow along. Uh, if I were in class uh, like this and uh, I had my laptop with me, I would probably be using it to take notes directly on the PowerPoint slides or I might drag them into OneNote. Uh, if I had a device with like an Apple Pencil or something or a, a Surface Pro and I would write uh, directly on them. There's lots of advantages uh, to using digital notebooks uh, and being able to take notes in class. So I think there's a reason people do it. It's not just because they like having their laptop with them. It's because it's uh, there's a convenience. So we notice two things. We notice people are packed in way too much uh, for proper, proper social distancing, but we also notice a lot of laptops. So I want to come back to the idea of laptops. Second example. What do you notice here? Uh, first of all, yes, everybody's sitting too close to each other. Uh, and two, they're also looking at laptops. But three, they've got uh, a device, right? So everybody has a smartphone. Uh, now, my guess, uh, in, based on the caption for when I took this picture, is they're not just uh, using their phones for uh, social purposes. They're probably responding to some online to an online quiz, uh, right? Uh, they're using a clicker app on their phone, and that's pretty common uh, in educational settings, right? So you use uh, you embrace the use of the smartphone. So that's the second thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, the pros and cons of using your laptop to take notes and the pros and cons of having a smartphone uh, nearby, which most of us do. I mean, uh, there are probably a handful of times when you don't have your phone, but I mean, I've got one right here, right? So it's always going to be on. Um, it's always going to be near us. Uh, if I'm, if I were giving this lecture in class, uh, I'd probably look out and I would assume that most of you would have your phone uh, in front of you, uh, turn face up or turn face down, or maybe in your pocket or something like that. It's just become an extension of who we are. Um, and even if you don't have your phone out, uh, a lot of us also have uh, smart watches. Uh, my smart watch does not, uh, is set to not receive text messages. Uh, it's not an Apple watch. So uh, I just use it for you know, fitness tracking and that sort of thing. I don't really want to have the notifications show up, but it's a common way to get notifications and get uh, all sorts of things, right? So even if you don't have your phone, you're getting them on your watch. So the question is, with all of those interruptions, uh, can it impact performance? I mean, it probably does. It does impact performance a little bit if you're always looking over at your phone. Uh, that's a split second when your attention is diverted from something else, right? And that's what happens when people are uh, looking down at their phone while they're driving, um, which, I mean, I hope nobody does, but I know people do because when I drive uh, and uh, I don't use my phone when I drive because it's plugged into the uh, car, uh, so it can be used. I can talk to it. I don't have to look at it. It's 
face down beside me, so I can't see my phone, uh, but I can uh, get text messages read to me uh, on the Apple CarPlay or whatever it's called. It's a useful function. Uh, so I can still communicate, but I don't need to look at my phone. But if I drive and I'm looking ahead at other drivers, I see a lot of people. Uh, I, I'm not doing the stats, but it's well more than half the people that I see uh, who are driving looking down, uh, looking down at their phone. So uh, it's a distraction. Uh, we know it's a distraction. Uh, but how much of a cognitive distraction is it? In other, words, in other words, if you're not looking at your phone, if it's just there, uh, just, just knowing it there, is that kind of a distraction? Well, that's a question uh, that Adrian Ward uh, asked um, in, uh, the, uh, a few, in a study a few years ago. Um, and they called this the brain drain. Uh, the mere presence of one's own smartphone reduces available cognitive capacity. And what they found was that uh, just having your phone near you, uh, even face down uh, and not checking it, uh, can be enough to distract you on tasks that are cognitively demanding. Uh, so what they did was they had several hundred undergraduate participants, uh, and they completed a series of tasks. And some of these tasks, uh, we're going to talk about a task uh, called the O-SPAN task. The O-SPAN task is an operation span task of working memory. Uh, where you have to carry out some simple math problems, simple arithmetic problems, at the same time that you're being presented with a sequence of letters. Uh, then, at the end of this task, you remember the letters. So you're being asked to do simple arithmetic and remember uh, numbers, or remember letters, rather. Uh, and they ask their subjects to um, uh, do this task in one of three conditions. Uh, so the other room condition uh, is when, when, when you went to the lab, uh, you left all of your belongings, including your phone, uh, in a different room, and then you entered the lab room. Uh, the desk condition, uh, you left most of your other belongings, but you brought your phone with you specifically for use in a later study. There was no later study. That's just what they were told. Uh, so you were told to bring your phone with you uh, and place it face down. Uh, participants in the pocket bag condition carried all of their belongings into the testing room with them, kept their phones wherever they naturally would, so on the desk, in their backpack, in their pocket, wherever you would naturally keep your phone. Um, and then they asked, you know, most, ha basically half of them said pockets, the other half uh, said bags, and uh, likely this is, I would assume, people who typically wore clothing with pockets, probably kept them in pockets, and people who didn't wear clothing with pockets typically kept them in a bag. Um, so after you entered the uh, testing room, uh, you did this O-SPAN task, uh, along with a Raven Standard Progressive Matrices task, which is a task of uh, uh, reasoning. Uh, and um, uh, was there another task? No, I think it was just these two tasks. Uh, so the O-SPAN task is a, uh, is a measure of working memory control. Uh, so you keep, task of, keep track of what's relevant uh, while engaging in something else, and in this case, uh, a letter sequence while you're doing uh, simple math problems. Uh, we don't care about your ability to do math problems. What we care about is your ability, how many of the letters can you remember simultaneously. So it's not an easy task. It's not just how long is your working memory. It's how many things can you keep track of while you're doing something else. Uh, and they suspected that if subjects were uh, doing this task, they're doing the math, they're keeping track of the numbers or letters, and they sometimes keep glancing over at their phone, that that's going to interfere with their performance. So their prediction was that if the phone's there with you, uh, you're going to do worse uh, on this particular task. Um, the other task, which is this Raven's Progressive Matrices task, is a task of fluid uh, intelligence. They, fluid intelligence, uh, and they suspected that there might be an effect uh, here as well, uh, because if you're being interfered with, uh, so additional interference uh, would likely uh, reduce your ability to solve some of these problems. It's kind of what they found. So working memory capacity, uh, you can see the O-SPAN score, which is the number, the, the number of strings of letters that you can remember uh, while you're doing this task. So it's a, a, a raw score, um, along with the fluid intelligence uh, tasks, so the correctly solved uh, matrices. Having your phone on the desk seemed to significantly impair your working memory capacity. So there's a significant difference uh, between uh, performance 
when it's on your desk versus having it be in the other room. And in fact, even just having it near you in your pocket or bag uh, was enough to uh, significantly reduce. Now, just let me point out, it's not a huge reduction in terms of overall raw numbers. Uh, so the score uh, is somewhere between 30 and 31 when it's on your desk and somewhere between 33 and 34. So it's a significant difference because of the large sample size. Um, and they've, you know, this accounts for most of the variance in the sample, but it boils down to a few extra items. Um, you also see this effect in fluid intelligence, by the way. Having the phone on your desk uh, seems to mean that you're going to solve, uh, on average, uh, one fewer uh, progressive matrices uh, tasks. So these are significant differences, even though they're not large uh, overall differences. Um, however, there's a caveat here, um, and that is that this effect is not, so as I said, it's not a strong effect in terms of the actual impact. So its clinical relevance or its real-world relevance might be kind of small, even though it's a strong experimental effect. Um, furthermore, it's not clear if uh, this effect is stable. Um, that gets at this issue of scientific replicability. So you probably learned this in uh, Psych 1000, you probably learned it in a methods course if you've taken that, and that is the idea that science and scientific experiments should be able to be uh, replicated or reproduced. Now that doesn't mean that every time you do an experiment you get the same effect. What it means is that you should be able to reproduce the experiment, uh, and if it's a stable effect, you should usually find that effect uh, holding out. You should usually find a significant difference between uh, the two conditions or whatever it is. Um, if you can reproduce the experiment and uh, you tend to find different results, then it suggests that maybe it's not a stable effect. Uh, and I've got my doubts about this, whether or not this is a stable effect. I do think that phones um, are a distraction, uh, but I'm not sure that they're the kind of distraction that Ward et al. Uh, thought. Why do I think that? Well, we, we've done a few uh, replications, extensions, uh, and additional work on this. So uh, here's just a short write-up of a um, project that one of my grad students, uh, Anna, and two of my honor students worked on uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, we essentially uh, used the same conditions. Uh, we used a uh, on-the-desk-in-the-other-room condition. Uh, and we used a series of online tasks. Uh, in this particular paper, because it was based on an honors thesis, used one of the online so here's the uh, task that we asked our subjects to do. So remember, they're in a uh, condition where their phone is either right in front of them on the desk, face down, power off, or uh, it's in a different room. Uh, now, there's a whole battery of tasks, which I've labeled here as the Cambridge Brain Sciences task. In this case, it was an honors project, so we focused on one of these. Uh, and we focused on what was typically the most difficult of the tasks, uh, which is this double Stroop task. Uh, they call it the double trouble task. Uh, in figure two, the double trouble task is one in which your job is to pick which two of the words on the bottom describe the color of the ink of the word on the top. So in the one that's labeled congruent, where you see the word red in red ink, uh, and then you see two choices, your job is to pick the word red because the word red describes the color of the ink that the word red is written in, right? Uh, and that's congruent because everything is the same. They're both red, uh, they're, they're both red ink, uh, and it's easy to choose, right? So you should be fast this time. The incongruent condition, uh, the word red at the top is actually written in blue ink, so the correct answer is to choose blue, right? So you need to switch over and choose the word blue uh, because you're looking at blue ink. Um, that's singly incongruent. In the doubly incongruent, the word red is written in blue ink, and the correct answer is the word blue written in red ink. So you've got to work around all of those. Uh, it kind of gives you a headache just thinking about it. Um, and our, what we suspected is that if this is, this is challenging enough as it is, right? Uh, but if your phone is in front of you causing a distraction, uh, you would be your performance would be impaired here because thinking through this doubly incongruent uh, task would require more cognitive resources and if the mere presence of your smartphone uh, robs you of those cognitive resources we should see a deficit here. We did not see a deficit here and you can see that uh, the average double trouble score uh, which is um, a combination of the uh, 
errors that you make when there's a congruent or versus incon congruent versus incongruent uh, responses, uh, you can see there's, there's essentially no difference, right? Uh, so when it's on the desk, you can see a range of individual points. Those are the, the blue dots. Uh, but you can see the average uh, somewhere around 30. And when the phone was outside, you can see it's pretty much the same, right? Not only are those means the same, uh, but the distribution of scores uh, is pretty similar. Um, we've looked at all of the other tasks. Uh, there are some subtle effects, particularly when uh, participants self-report that they are very highly attached to their phones. So we have a measure called the Smartphone Dependency Questionnaire and another measure called the Nomophobia uh, Questionnaire. Nomophobia is not a real phobia per se from a clinical definition. The noma in nomophobia means no mobile phone. <laughs> Uh, and it's an idea that you kind of get anxious when your phone isn't there. So, I mean, we all kind of are like that. If someone else took your phone from you, uh, you might feel a little bit uh, uh, ill at ease because, well, it's, you know, it's an expensive device, but also it has your personal information on it. So it's natural to feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable if somebody takes your phone the same way that you might feel uncomfortable if they took your wallet. Um, but other people self-report uh, feeling kind of anxious if they're not without their phone or if their phone is on low battery. We have found that for some of these tasks, people who score high on that do show some reductions. Uh, so there are some individual differences, but they're not very strong. Um, the same student, Anna, who's one of my PhD students, uh, has also tried to replicate Ward's result directly. Uh, so here is our O-SPAN task result, uh, and we did a direct uh, replication of their study, where we used the exact same version of the OSPAN task online. Uh, we used the um, same conditions at the desk, pocket bag, outside. Uh, we used the same instructions as near as we could tell and a, roughly the same sample size, um, and we were unable to detect a difference. Uh, it didn't make a difference whether the smartphone was on or off. Uh, we didn't find any difference uh, between the absolute score on this OSPAN task for phones on the desk versus pocket bag versus outside. What it seems to be is that uh, we've done enough work on this that I just don't think it's a very strong effect. I think there are some cases where people might be distracted by their phones, uh, but it might be an individual difference. There's also a possibility, which we just can't tell right now, uh, that perhaps maybe uh, as students have become more familiar with working with their phones, they've adopted strategies to ignore them. People don't have notifications on, right? Uh, my phone makes no noises, uh, and probably yours doesn't either. Uh, so we get better at just ignoring them. That's something the behaviorists called uh, habituation. You just get used to it, right? We get used to knowing that it's a potential distraction, and so we get used to not being distracted by it. So there's a possibility that Ward's study correctly identified an effect, and this effect just starts to disappear uh, with time as people uh, in different cohorts have come up through elementary and high school and university uh, always with their phones and being really used to just turning them over and ignoring them when they need to. So that's thing that was topic number one. Is your smartphone a distraction? Sometimes, but probably not at the cognitive level. Um, the other question is, what about taking notes on your laptop? Is that uh, problematic? Uh, there was a study that came out uh, in 2014 that created really a big splash, uh, partially because it has a really great name. The pen is mightier than the keyboard. The advantages of longhand over laptop note-taking. It was published in the premier journal uh, for psychological science called uh, Psychological Science. Uh, and uh, this paper uh, was like I said, it made a big splash uh, in 2014. Um, and what they found over a series of experiments was that when people were asked to take notes using their laptop, irrespective of being distracted by phones and the internet, so these are just, you know, this is a laptop that is disconnected from the internet, there's no distraction, they're just literally using Microsoft Word to take notes, that they didn't remember things as well. Here's an example of the kind of experiments they did. They did three experiments in this paper. Um, I'll just tell you about the one. Uh, we've got a group of 33, uh, sorry, 67 participants, and they're going to watch some TED Talks, very short TED Talks, uh, which is kind of like a university lecture, right? 
um, interesting, but not something that they're familiar with. Um, and some of the participants were asked uh, to take notes by hand. Other participants, the other group of participants, was asked to take notes on a laptop uh, that was disconnected from the internet. So we've got a laptop group and we've got a, uh, a note notebook group. And across these three experiments, they wanted to measure a few things. First of all, they measured the number of words that you wrote down when you took notes. That's called word count. Second, they measured the uh, percentage of words that were verbatim overlap with what was being said. Verbatim overlap is mean, means that you write down exactly what you hear. Uh, so if you were taking notes verbatim, you would write down verbatim overlap means writing down exactly what you hear, because that's what I said. Right? So you'd write everything down exactly as you hear it. So that could also be a good measure of how good your notes are. Then they had a series of multiple choice questions. Some of them were purely factual, based on direct recall of something the speaker had said. Uh, and others they called conceptual, meaning that they were extensions of what the person had said, reflecting a deeper understanding. And you know these kinds of questions. They show up on exams all the time, right? Some exam questions are direct recall. Others are applications or extensions or conceptual understanding. So three dependent variables, word count, uh, verbatim overlap, and performance on these conceptual and uh, factual items. What they found was that taking notes uh, on a laptop, on average, uh, people wrote more words. They typed more things. People are faster typers, typists than they are uh, handwriters. Uh, I'm also a faster typist, though a very poor one, because I never learned how to touch type in uh, high school or uh, grade school, which is it's my one true regret in life, is that I didn't take typing class uh, when it was offered. And so my keyboarding skills, uh, even at age 51, having used a keyboard uh, since the late 1980s are just abysmal. Uh, so I'm a bad typist, but I still type faster than I write, and I'm not a bad writer. Um, so that is a pretty clear finding. People write more, and they also do more verbatim overlap. You can see that on the right-hand side there, that the percentage of things that people write when they take notes with a laptop is much higher than it is when they uh, take notes by hand. So you're writing more words and you're writing exactly what the speaker says, but how do you perform on uh, questions? So what they found when they standardized these things is that when they were factual items, so direct recall, there didn't seem to be a difference, but they found a significant difference, not a huge one, but a significant one, uh, which showed an advantage for a laptop uh, you, sorry, for longhand users over laptop users. In other words, if you wrote notes by hand, you did better, significantly better, on these uh, conceptual questions. They suspected that a couple of things were happening here. First of all, um, the act of writing, even though you don't write many words, uh, forces you to think a little bit more deeply about what those things are. Uh, so they're like little memory cues that allow you to process it more deeply. Uh, as opposed to typing out exactly what you hear, you're focused more on getting the factual, uh, direct uh, representation of what you heard. You're focused more on writing down the words that you hear and not thinking about what they actually mean. We'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about memory and we talk about uh, levels of processing. But uh, that's the, pr the primary explanation, is that people tended to process things more deeply uh, when they were asked uh, to write notes by hand. Um, and this, uh, this effect seemed to hold even when they asked their participants to uh, try not to transcribe things ver verbatim. So they would tell their laptop note takers, don't try to type everything out that the speaker says, try to process it more deeply, and they still found this effect. Um, strong enough that a few years, uh, that around that time, a few years later, uh, prominent well-known psychologist, and in this case an economist, um, wrote an article, an op-ed in the New York Times uh, explaining why she had chosen to ban laptops from her uh, eco economics classes. Um, and you can read the whole thing there if you want to click on the link, uh, but here's what you know, she says essentially a conclusion that was uh, based on the Mueller and Oppenheimer study, uh, which is that um, she finds the evidence compelling, 
Uh, she bans electronics from her classes, with the exception of people who need electronic devices to take notes because of a, a learning disability or an accommodation. Now, that's, by the way, is a bit of a problem because it means that the person with the um, a uh, person who needs the accommodation needs to make extra effort to uh, take notes uh, on a laptop that everyone else is not using, and that signals to the rest of the class, hey, I have uh, a learning disability because I'm allowed to use a laptop. Uh, the author of, the, of this op-ed took a lot of uh, criticism for that one uh, particular uh, for that particular uh, aspect. Um, but she argues that the negatives are weighed against the learning uh, benefits of being asked to take notes um, uh, by hand. There is, again, one big problem here, and that is that the effect is unstable. Uh, we're gonna, this is going to come up a lot, actually. Um, a lot of cognitive psychological research work on working memory and uh, long-term and short-term memory is very stable. Attentional research and perception research is quite stable. But as you start getting into some of the applied research, uh, what seems to happen uh, is that these effects are not as stable as we often think. And that's just the way science progresses, right? Uh, you see something, you publish it because it's interesting, uh, other people are interested in trying to replicate it, and maybe it doesn't hold up. Uh, a lot of stuff does, but a lot of stuff doesn't. Uh, and this work um, has since been published. Uh, this is a preprint version of it uh, from last year. Um, and they found that across many different labs, it's a mini meta analysis, all these authors here, uh, led by uh, Heather Urey, um, carried out uh, replications of this study. Uh, and they found uh, that it did not hold up. Uh, so, um, direct replications across several different labs. Uh, they were unable to find uh, this effect. Um, here's what the results actually looked like. Uh, you can see on the top, by the way, um, that they did not, that they did replicate the lack of a difference. Uh, in other words, factual performance was the same between laptop and longhand group. These violin plots, by the way, are a better way to show uh, the data than the simple bar plots that Mueller and Oppenheimer showed. And you saw in some of the data that I presented from my own lab, although we don't use the violins, we also plot individual data. It gives you a much better performance. So bar plots with error, error bars, it's okay, but it's not so good. But violin plots or individual points, much better. Uh, so here it's showing the mean, which is the dark line, but also the individual variance, uh, suggesting that for factual items, no difference. For conceptual item, no difference. However, they did replicate the difference on laptop users generally writing more. Though interestingly, uh, because you can see the individual range of the data, you can see that a lot of that is uh, driven by uh, a handful of high performers, in other words, really good typists uh, who just type a lot of words. Uh, it's still an advantage. Uh, but that mean is being pulled up uh, by that spike at the top. And you can see kind of the same thing for the laptop users. There's some good typists who uh, have high verbatim overlap, uh, not so much for longhand. So they replicated the non-important part. Uh, people do write more words with their laptops. They do uh, write more verbatim overlap. But across a large study and a large sample size and across multiple labs, they find no effect uh, for the benefit for longhand note-taking. So you want to take notes by hand, go right ahead and do it. This suggests it makes no difference. You want to take notes on your laptop, go right ahead and do it. This study, uh, this you know, more complete study suggests it's not going to make a difference. Uh, in the long run, I really don't think it makes any difference at all. Uh, sure, your laptop can be a distraction if you allow it to be by having multiple tabs open with, uh, you know, YouTube videos in the background. Uh, that's you know, that's not controversial. You don't need a Research studies to suggest that if you're watching a YouTuber at the same time that you're trying to watch a uh, pay attention in a lecture and take notes, that you're probably not going to take as good a notes. That's that is not a, a controversy, right? That's just an an objective fact. Um, last little piece here. I want to talk about online learning because last year you did all your classes online, uh, and of course some of this class is online. Um, so this is an online lecture. Uh, how does it work? Uh, how did you find that? I found it to be a little bit 
tedious, uh, let's say, uh, to say the least. Um, here's uh, an article that I wrote um, about this time last year. This is from October 16th in 2020, and this is on the uh, social blogging platform Medium. Um, and my observations, uh, this is not an empirical study, this is really just an opinion piece, uh, is that up until uh, March 2020, uh, when we all first went into the initial lockdown, uh, I had rarely used uh, video conferencing, right? I had used GoToMeeting, I had used Zoom a little bit, I had used uh, FaceTime and Google Hangouts, but sparingly, really just when there was somebody, uh, maybe I was collaborating with someone in Germany. Uh, and we were meeting together, or I had a student who was interviewing from the Netherlands. So it would be those kinds of scenarios. I wasn't doing everything on Zoom, but I quickly had to learn how to do it, right? Using Zoom or Skype or Teams or whatever. Um, and I noticed that by the uh, sort of the end of the summer and into the fall, that my I was just forgetting more things than I used to. Uh, I would have a meeting with a grad student, and I might forget uh, what we were talking about last week. I might forget the project that they were working on. And yes, I'm 51 and I'm an absent-minded professor, but this was worse than usual. Um, and I started thinking about how my work environment uh, had changed a lot. And it wasn't just Zoom meetings and online classes. It was that everything was being done in the same room. So uh, this probably, this is my experience as a professor, but this probably mir mirrors your experience as a student. I began to teach online using Zoom. Uh, and I was doing synchronous and asynchronous teaching. Uh, weekly meetings with all of my grad students on Zoom, lab meetings on Zoom, we held department meetings on Zoom, we had our PhD defenses on Zoom, master's thesis defenses on Zooms, uh, formal Zoom talks, and people started initially doing uh, Zoom coffee breaks and Zoom happy hours, which everyone got tired with pretty quickly. Uh, academic conferences, which is usually a place to leave, you know, that's usually where you leave your home institution, you travel to a conference hotel, and you mix with people from other uh, universities and uh, research institutes. That started going online because uh, we can't do that anymore. Um, and pretty soon I found that I was doing all of my teaching, writing, research, committee work, mentoring, all from the same screen, from the same computer in the same room, which was a converted uh, home office. You can see the backdrop drop here is my university office. Occasionally I'll record these from my home office and it looks like a home office, right? It's got home look to it and not university office look to it and usually the cat will be off in the background. So everything was the same. I, I literally worked at home, you know, pretty comfortably and you know, productively, but everything looked the same. It was always the same screen whether I was uh, watching the news uh, or doing work, or uh, catching up on Twitter, everything was all on that same screen, and it was just hard to remember. Um, and a lot of my research and teaching work is able to be carried out at home. I began to notice these small changes. Uh, I might talk with a student for the wrong project, or confuse one meeting with another. Um, and here was my explanation for the source of the problem, and we'll come back to this when we talk about memory. Source errors. Everything looked the same. Uh, and this is different from how it used to be. Um, and many of you uh, will finally get a sense of what Western is, is you know, what university classes are like. Um, everything was in a different place, right? Uh, for as long as I've been in university as a student, a grad student, a postdoc, and as a professor, lectures were in classrooms and lecture halls, uh, seminars in small discussion rooms. I'd meet with students in my office, and we'd hold office hours uh, in my office, and I'd meet with colleagues maybe at a cafe, and committee meetings were in a different room, and uh, I might work at home on writing work or reading work, and I might work on data analysis in my office. Um, different tasks seem to be in different places. So when I was thinking about teaching, I was in the classroom. When I was thinking about data analysis, I was in my office. When I was thinking about writing uh, maybe uh, something that was non-academic, like the book that I was working on, that might be in my home office. Everything was in a different place, and I could use those places as memory cues that all vanished because everything was the same place. Um, this natural tendency to associate place with function was working against me. Um, so each day began and ended at the desk in my home office. Each day I was in the same location when I taught, wrote, met, carried out analyses, and it was the same location where I read the news, caught up on Twitter, and ordered groceries online. And this new kind of forgetfulness was this interference where everything started to look the same. You sit down to your screen and you say, what am I here for? What am I doing? Is this, 
is this work? Is this uh, shopping? Uh, is this banking work? Uh, am I sending an email to uh, my kid's school? It all looked the same. Uh, and so I wasn't just forgetting things. I just wasn't remembering things in the right way. I'm going to come back to this when we talk about um, source confusion and memory errors uh, later on in this term. So let's talk about the take-home message. I've been going for about... So what are the take-home messages here? I've got three take-home messages. First of all, you can use a laptop or a notebook to take notes. Just review your notes and summarize the material. It doesn't seem to be an advantage for uh, writing your notes over uh, using a laptop, and there doesn't seem to be an advantage for using a laptop over writing your notes. Um, there might be some small, subtle differences. Maybe you write a little bit more, but I think in a classroom setting, an educational setting, as long as you're reviewing your notes, uh, you're going to do just fine. Um, number two, uh, smartphones can be a distraction, but maybe not at the cognitive psychological level. They might not be affecting your ability to uh, pay attention to things. Uh, only if you let them. If you choose to keep looking at your phone while you're driving, of course, that's a distraction, right? Uh, if you're making a choice to be distracted, that's a different issue. Uh, it does not seem to be the case that just having your phone on your desk uh, is enough of a distraction to uh, reduce your performance on uh, tasks that measure things like working memory and attention. Number three, and this is a sort of a big take-home message for the entire course, understanding more about cognitive psychology uh, can help you understand more about yourself. Um, it can also help you understand a little bit more about your ability to learn new things and your ability to make sense of your experiences, your ability to make sense of the world.